All right, from current slide. And here's Ashland. And I did return the first test, so everybody turned that in. Okay, now, several, at least two announcements I can think of. Last Friday, I was hoping to have four solid hours of office hours. Well, actually, it wasn't bad. I, I got majority, but neither my boss nor his secretary were in last Friday. I didn't know they weren't going to be there, so I was the only one in the office, so anything that came up, I had to handle. So, and not too many things did, but I know the dean came by, and she was looking for him, but she wanted to chat for a while, so that ate a chunk out of my time, but, you know, can't expect everything. So, I did get everything done that I intended. I did get all of my three biggest math classes caught up in Blackboard, in my grade book, everything that I needed for those three. Um, and for this class, I got Blackboard caught up except for the grades. I didn't get the grades entered in Blackboard, but I got your Syllabus, I had just a couple of little corrections to make on the syllabus and the research paper instructions. I got those made. I got them on Blackboard. I got all the PowerPoints on Blackboard. And I got uh, my locator card. I copied the two other files that I had. Well, actually, eight, uh, seven, not 11 other files. Ten beautiful shots from the Hubble Space Telescope. They're on there now. And they're called Hubble 1 through Hubble 10. There's nothing special about them. It's just that they're there. Uh, just really nice shots. And then the space objects and perspectives, that's there. And the YouTube video link is there. So everything is in Blackboard now except your grades. Sorry I didn't get to get that finished, okay? In fact, I didn't even get to finish your grades. I got your first labs graded. I got your first test graded, and I got maybe about half or so of the second labs graded, but I didn't have a chance to put them in Blackboard yet. So that's coming up. If I have a chance, I'll do some of them this evening. Uh, I get home late tonight, uh, and if I have a chance, I'll get some of them done this evening. But if I don't get them done this evening, I've got two hours tomorrow afternoon for office hours. So I hope to be able to get those done. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the office hours, though. And this is open to any of you. In fact, one of you heard about it this morning. Um, Lawson last year started having a math team and went on at least one or two sets of competitions, and the students had a, a, a really good time doing it. Uh, if any of you are interested in being in the on the math team, then... Uh, we certainly would welcome you to be there. Uh, Ms. Nyla Geraci is technically the coach of it, but we hold review sessions here, and she holds them on that campus, and she may even come and uh, hold some on this campus. So uh, the students who did it last year, I think, had a lot of fun, and I think they learned some math, too, and learned to be a lot more comfortable with math. So it, it was a good, really good time, a good experience. So if any of you are interested in doing that, by all means, you know, let us know and we'll get you the information you need. Uh, you do get to go on competitions and that kind of thing. Okay? Because I'm going to help coach the math team on this campus, uh, the only time I have to do that is my only office hours, Monday, Wednesday afternoon, 3.15 to 5.15. However... What this only student who's expressed an interest in it so far uh, has class starting at 4.45. So 3.15 3 to 4.45 on most Mondays and Wednesdays, at least until I, we settle things down, may be eaten up with uh, uh, math practice. But so far, 
that hasn't started yet. I don't know if it'll start tomorrow or not. Okay. No, you're in here. There you are, Chelsea, right? Okay. And I also have this class was about the best class I ever have had about getting the first test in completed on time. So here's your first test. Huh? Yeah. Okay. So uh, as I was explaining before, I've got everything in Blackboard except your grades. Okay, I'll get those in as soon as I can. And um, that was what I was just talking about because the math team has started and I'm going to be sort of coaching it on this campus uh, some of the time. There goes a good portion of my office hours on Monday and Wednesday afternoon. I don't know if we'll start that as early as tomorrow, but uh, yeah, it eats up the time. So anyway, the next announcement is not nearly, hopefully it won't affect this class at all. I have a doctor's appointment next Tuesday, a week from today, but it's 10 o'clock in the morning, and if he sees me at 10, I should be back on campus shortly after 11, or maybe even by 11. So it should not interfere with this class at all. I cannot imagine it taking so long that it's going to interfere with the class. They never do, never have, so I'm hoping it's not going to be the case. He doesn't see any patients in the afternoon, so I should be through well before 11.15. But I will not be on campus that morning. Uh, I've got labs at 9, and if I drove to campus, I'd have to turn around and drive home uh, or drive back to uh, the Kirkland Clinic. I'd have to leave here by 8.15 to be sure I got back there and got parked and got to the lab before 9 o'clock. So uh, I won't be coming to campus that morning. Hopefully get here shortly after 11. Teach my third class, not my first two. And, then, and that's another thing. Uh, I'm making up one of those tests, those classes that I'm missing next Tuesday not this coming Friday, but the following Friday. So I won't be on Birmingham that Friday. I'll be here on this campus. Uh, not this coming Friday, but the following Friday. I think that's all. Okay. Any questions before we go any further? Did you say something about next Tuesday? Okay. Next Tuesday, I have a doctor's appointment, but it shouldn't interfere with this class at all. Okay. Right. Now, there will be another announcement that will pertain to this class, but let me wait a little. Well, let's go on and talk about it now. We should finish Chapter 16 pretty easily today, okay? We'll probably go on and start on Chapter 17. 16 ends the astronomy part of the course, okay? And usually when we finish this, I try to make an arrangement with Sanford University, the uh, planetarium director there, to let us come by and he'll give us a show at the planetarium. Uh, I haven't gotten in touch with him yet because uh, we're not quite finished. Want to make sure everything would be okay. So that could happen as early as Tuesday, Thursday. I doubt if it will, but that would be the earliest. If you say, well, I'm all booked up. I can hold you next Tuesday, next, uh, this coming Thursday, day after tomorrow. Don't think that's going to happen, but uh, in case it does, I'll send you a message on email uh, on Blackboard. It'll send you an email. It'll also be announced on Blackboard. So watch for that before Thursday's class. I don't think that's likely to happen. It'll probably be sometime in the next week or so before that happens. Okay? Fred, right? Yes, sir. All right. There you are. Okay. And also, I have for you. Okay, so a little bit of a reminder then, if you haven't turned in the first lab, please get the first lab in, okay? 
because we uh, have already returned the first test. We still have some people who haven't turned in the first lap. So please get those. There's not many, but just a few. I haven't finished grading the second lab, but uh, and the grades are not in Blackboard yet, but hopefully they will be relatively soon. I can't say when. Hopefully by before class on Thursday. Okay? Hopefully. Okay. And let's see, anything else? Okay. Yeah, and what we were talking about before. Okay, we'll finish Chapter 16 today. That means we'll have the lab on Chapter 16 today, or at least the first part of it. Okay? It'll be most of the lab. Actually, it's kind of the last part of it we'll do in class. I'll explain how to do the first part, uh, and that's coming up. I dropped them by to be copied this morning. I haven't had a chance to pick them up. Hopefully, if you got them copied, I'll pick those up when we have a break today. Okay? Yes? So are we going to take the test today for Chapter 16? No, no, no. Usually, we'll wait till we finish a chapter the next time we'll have the test. So the odds are the test for 16 will be Thursday, the last 30 minutes. Okay? The, the reason I say the odds are I haven't talked with the guy at Planetarium. If he says, no, the only time you, we can do it is Thursday, then we'll do the lab Thursday and then have the test maybe the next Tuesday or something. That's the only thing that would keep us from having the test on Thursday. Okay. Good deal. So we'll get started. We'll finish 16, get started on 17, have the lab on 16, or at least the first part of it, because y'all are going to do the last part of the lab over the next two to four weeks. Okay? Uh, we'll talk about that when we get the lab up here. So please get your first lab in, second lab in, and if any of you haven't done the second test, get those caught up too. All right, any questions before we get going where we left off last time? We're, if you got the new text, it's on around page 421. We're talking about yearly time. Okay? Now, I don't know if you recall, there are two different kinds of days you can talk about. Days based on the sun, which we call solar days, or days based on the stars, which we call sidereal days. Okay? Well, here we have yearly time. And again, we can base yearly time on the sun or stars, one or the other. Okay? Based on the sun, the interval between two consecutive spring or vernal equinoxes, that's all depending on us and the sun, that would make what they call a tropical year. Why tropical? Why not solar? I don't know. They just use a different name for it here. Tropical year. Okay? And that is, this is our standard, 365.24220 mean solar days. Okay? And here's Sam. All right, turned out being pretty good attendance here so far. And here's your first test. Thank you. All right. Um, unfortunate that we don't spin exactly a, a whole number of spins in one trip around the sun. If we did, this wouldn't be a decimal there, would it? But it is. So what's the result of that? Leap years. Okay? Because it's a little more than 365 days, and it's almost a quarter of a day, not quite. That means once every four years, we add a day to make up from this almost a quarter of a day, three de years in a row, that would be almost a day. So every year whose last digit is divisible by four, that's a leap year. Would this year be a leap year? No, it wasn't. Next year? No. Okay? We don't have another one until? 2020. Yeah, 2020. Exactly. Okay? Then that will be a leap year. Okay? Yes? 
was born in late. If somebody has a birthday on Leader Day, yeah. do they count it March 1st or February 28th? It's up to the person. Up to the person. Yeah. Uh, I had a friend in Nebraska. Or I had a first, uh, a cousin anyway. I believe he was a first cousin. Yeah. I have a cousin who was born on a, a leap day in February 29th. I don't remember when he did it. I had a friend in Nebraska who was also born on February 29th. I think he celebrated his on March 1st, not February 28th. Uh, but on the other hand, we often called them kids because they were a quarter as, as old as young. Wow, you're driving at only four, what, four years? Yeah, okay. You know, I had four birthdays. Uh, now, but doing that, we get a little bit ahead, don't we? Because it's not quite a quarter of a year. How do we account for that? Does anyone know? It has happened once in your lifetime and will not happen again in your lifetime. What's that? Okay. Yeah, um, no, no, okay. Once in a blue moon? Yeah. Okay. That happens. That will hopefully happen several times in your lifetime. Okay. So, years whose uh, last, you might say two digits are divisible by four, those we do have a leap year. That means every century would be divisible by four, right? 2000, year 2000, we did not have a leap year. Because every century that's divisible by four, we don't have a leap day that year. That's how we catch up that, you know. Otherwise, we'd be getting a little bit a year. So we had, we did not have a leap year like 2100. That was divisible by four. That, it will be divisible by four, but 2000. Okay, 2000 was divisible by 4, but 20 is also divisible by 4, so that one, year 2000, Y2K, we did not have a leap day that year. Go back and check your calendars. Uh, you'll find there was no leap day that year. Okay. All right. The other kind of year, we do use the same name, a sidereal year, based on the stars. The interval between two consecutive alignments of the Earth and the Sun relative to a given star. Okay? So let's just say you'll be a star, right? Okay? And uh, you'll be the Sun. So when I'm right here and you two line up, then we'll start that year. I go all the way around and come back here. And when you two line up again, then that would be the next sidereal year. That has nothing to do with spring equinox, okay? The interval between two consecutive alignments of the Earth and the Sun relative to the stars is about 20 minutes longer than a tropical year. Not a big difference, 20 minutes out of that long, okay? The adjustments to keep the calendar year current with the seasons, we do leap years. And they even can do things like leap seconds, and a leap second is not very well defined or described here. I was going to say at one time there was a little blurb, but I don't think they have those anymore. No, uh, on that. So don't worry about that. We know what a leap year is, and we have them every four years except for centuries that are divisible by four. Year 2000, we didn't. 2100, we will. 2200, we will. 2300, we will. But 2400, which is 400 years from now. Not going to bother me any, but that'll be the next time we will not have a leap year every four years. Okay. Make sense? Yep. All right. How about monthly time? Okay. Daily time depends on what? The spin of the Earth. Yearly time depends on the revolution of the Earth. What would monthly time depend on? Say again? The moon, exactly. You can almost see moon in month, okay? Now, 
Again, we have two different kinds of months. One is based on the stars. We always call those sidereal. The one based on the sun, not solar, not tropical, synodic. Why do they keep giving these different names? That's your synodic month. Okay? So, let's see. This picture sort of does this for us. It's the orbital time measured with respect to the stars, okay? So one time of the uh, moon around the, the, the uh, Earth, say the moon starts here and the moon's moving around the Earth like this as the Earth is moving. Then uh, one time around the Earth is moving while the moon is moving around us. So based on the stars, from here to there would be a sidereal month. That's about 27 and a third days, okay? Shorter than even February. We don't use the sidereal month. We really don't use sidereal days or, or years either. They're just based on, on stars. The synodic month, though, is a time interval between two consecutive phases of the moon. This is what we're going to be talking about a little bit later today. When the moon is opposite, so here's the sun, there's the earth and the moon's over here, then what we see from the earth is a completely illuminated half of the moon. That's called the full moon. Okay? When we get up to a, synodic, a sidereal month, it's not quite a full moon yet because the full would be the moon facing here. That's one, 27 and a third days later based on the stars we would be here. But it would have to go a little bit further, so that's 29 and a half days, a little over two days longer. That would be when we get the next full moon, because we've moved from not just here to here, that would be a sidereal month, but here to there, that would be a synodic month. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, a synodic month. That's the one we use, okay? Between two consecutive faces of the moon. Because the moon's always going around us, but we're also going around the sun, so it has to do a little catch up there to get back to a full moon again. Or a new moon, or whatever, is the time interval between two consecutive phases. About 29 and a half days, which is right in the middle of what our months are. Most of our months are 30 or 31, so this is right in between, you know, not, it's a little short of that, but one month is. Uh, 28, so it's a, that's longer than that month. But that also means we have more than one cycle per year, I mean per month. We had to divide it evenly by 12, so that's why we have different number of days in different months. Why they're not more regular, I don't know, okay, just how they were done. It includes the effect of the Earth revolving around the sun. Now, how do you know how many days are in each month? I know you look at a calendar, but if someone said, how many days are in September? How do you remember? Yeah, I know, but I mean, how do you know? If, if you get, how many days are in September? Calendar. Say again? You look at a calendar. So you don't have a calendar in front of you? Do any of you know how many? I think we'll do the library. January. Oh, very good. Okay. I've seen it done with the best, but you can do it like this. Okay. The ones that fall on the fingers are 31 days, and the ones that fall in the cracks between the fingers are less than 31 days. January 31, February less, March 31, April less, May 31, June less, July 31, I said that hard. No, you, you, you don't do the thought. Start with the thing. January, February, March, April, May, June, July. Then start back over. August, September, we're 30. October, November, December. Or you remember the little nursery rhyme. 30 days has September, April, June, and November. All the rest are 31, except for February, which is 35. 
Actually, that's what I do. <laughs> or I do this. Now, rather than forgetting about the thumb, people do the, 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 the knuckles or the, the things here. Uh, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. Same thing as this. Just don't include the thumb. Okay. All right. So those are monthly times. And again, just like the Earth doesn't spend exact number of days in one year, it's a fraction. The Moon doesn't circle the Earth exactly 12 times. I mean, yeah, 12 times a year. It's a fraction off. You know, so you can't go straight by the Moon, but that's approximately what it is. All right. That leads us then to the Moon. Okay? I think this is the last or next to the last section, no, next to the last, the moon, and then we do the earth-moon system, which is related to the moon. Okay. The moon is our closest neighbor, or you might say, the closest celestial body to us is the moon. It's our moon. It revolves around us, okay? It's the only thing that revolves around us, but it does except satellites and stuff. Uh, but it is about 380,000 kilometers away, which is approximately 250,000 miles away. That's approximately. Okay? Now, when you see it's characterized by craters, what does that tell you right there? Say again? It gets hit, and why does it get hit? No atmosphere, you're absolutely right. Okay, it's got lots of craters. It has highlands, they call them the lunar highlands, and then the Maria, okay, which are ancient lava flows. How did it get the name Maria? Maria, no, that's not that. It's, uh, that comes from the Latin or French or some sort of word. Mar, which means sea. When they first looked at it, they thought these darker areas, or these areas which seemed to be, they looked like sea, you know, something had flowed there. It wasn't water, it was ancient lava flows, not water. But it looked like a sort of the same thing. So originally they thought it might be water there. No, not. No atmosphere, and that's why we have the craters, yes. And we, it's been the subject of 12 Apollo missions, okay? There were many more Apollo missions than this, but not all of them went to the moon. Some of those were practice runs and, and things, testing things, but they're all part of the Apollo program, but only 12, but 12 of these actually made it to the moon. All right, and we'll talk about those just a little bit. Okay, here is the picture that's in your text, uh, and this is sort of a composite picture they put together from several different shots, so you got it together, and uh, let me make sure I say it right, the light colored are the lunar highlands, and the darker color are the Maria, is the Maria. So these are the highlands here, here and here and here, sort of like mountain ranges. And then the this almost looks like seas or, or uh, oceans or something in between. They're not. They're old lava flows. But those are the darker regions. Now this picture doesn't greatly show the cratering, uh, but if you look carefully, you can see there are some obvious ones here. You're not quite so obvious there and there. And and those here. Points. What's that? Okay. It's probably a crater. Uh, hard to say for sure. It's in the highland type area because it's light colored around there. Just the way things look there, it makes it look like it's the pole. It may be. Uh, but there are others. Oh, you mean other light color? Like up to the left, it looks like. Oh, yeah, like here? Like a, and yeah. there, yeah. Um, it's probably higher 
mountains. I mean, they have mountains. Okay, the moon has mountains. Um, and it actually also has volcanoes. And that's why I'm a little hesitant to say, that's why I said it could be a crater. It could be the top of those volcanic mountains. Uh, but these volcanoes have been extinct for so long. I kind of doubt that, but it could happen. Uh, but this doesn't show a real good picture, but if you really look carefully, I mean, you can see a lot of little splotches there that you would interpret to be craters, okay? And some of them are, are quite good sized, okay? Now, there's a little concept supplied here uh, mentioned in the book. A bigger moon, why does the moon appear so large when it is on the horizon? Uh, and then it says the moon is actually smaller when it is on the horizon than when it is overhead. It's smaller because it is on, when it's on the horizon, it's farther away from the Earth by one Earth radius. Uh, and they say it's an optical illusion that its moon is larger on the horizon. I don't really buy that, okay? In fact, what I was always told, remember it's moving through more atmosphere when it's on the horizon only moving through this much atmosphere when it's here, here it's moving through a lot more. And that sort of acts like a lens which is magnifying it. That's why I've always heard it looks larger on the surface, you know, when it's just rising. Uh, but they say you can test this by bending a paper clip so it is one moon wide when it's held at arm's length. You do it down here and up there and they say actually it's bigger up there. Uh, I'll let you try that. That's completely up to you. I don't know what was going to go there, except maybe the lunar missions, and they aren't, it's, since they're not there, let's take a moment to look at them. Okay? These are the ones that actually, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, roughly twelve. Twelve Apollo missions actually, well, they didn't make it to the moon. Uh, Twelve did. Don't count Apollo 1. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. What happened with the Apollo 1? Yeah, it never actually got launched. Okay? In fact, it wasn't even supposed to be launched that day. It was the, a couple of days before, three weeks before they would have launched. They were, yes? This is the one where they got in and um, the spaceship just kind of blew up in the first oh. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. The, the, there have been several like this. This one, a fire, it caught uh, I'm pretty sure it was a fire. They were just on it doing a test, you know, testing things out. The three astronauts then, do any of these names look familiar? Again? And white. Well, how, why is that familiar to you? It just seems familiar. It, it seems familiar because you hear a lot of, not a lot, it just seems like it sounds like a movie star name or something. Oh, okay. Um, any of you familiar with Huntsville, Alabama? Yeah. What's special about Huntsville? The space yeah, the Space Center. My wife graduated from a school in Huntsville. Say, no. No. Grissom. Gus Grissom. Yeah. The first high school built after the Apollo 1 disaster. They named the first high school. Grissom High School after Gus Grissom. The first junior high, I think, was Ed White. And it's Ed White Junior High or Middle School or whatever. And then there's a Roger Chafee Elementary School. Or I may have those last two backwards. I don't know. But they, they had, they, the next three schools built, one was high, one was junior high, and one was grammar. I know the high school was named after Gus Grissom. And he was the commander of the thing. They died that day. Notice it was more than a year and a half later before Apollo 7. 
there was a lengthy time when they did a lot of investigation of what went wrong before they put anybody else in the Apollo uh, uh, spaceship to do anything with it. Okay? Now. What happened to uh, Apollo 2? Six. Those were practice runs on doing various things, testing, probably a lot of them testing every unit they could find, uh, you know, to, to make sure they were going to operate well. I'm not even sure they were even manned. They may have been just set up, you know, and testing and bringing the water back. Okay. Um, which was, after that, the most famous? Okay, that was pretty famous. The one that everyone quotes? 11. That was one they actually landed on the moon. The others went up and orbited the moon. They did various things. They made it. They took data. They didn't actually land. The first one to land on the moon was Apollo 11. Neil Armstrong, Mike Collins, and Buzz Aldrin. And what is Buzz Aldrin the last alive? It seems like I've heard about him recently in the news. I don't know if the others are still alive or not. Uh, but then, after that, the next most famous or infamous is, was, you just named it, 13. 13. Now, besides being such a lucky number, what happened there? Is that the one that blew up? It did blow up, but it was the first that they had to abort in deep space. It came so close to being a tragedy. They actually had to, rather than being in the whole space thing, they had to crawl into the lunar module and drive it back. Yeah. Why did they have to board again? I mean, what happened? There? <coughs> it was some sort of leak. Either they were losing no. oxygen or what does it say here? Uh, it was using the light bulb. The lunar, lunar, lunar module, lunar. yeah. It doesn't say why, but I believe that they were losing pressure or losing oxygen or something. In the main spacecraft, they had to go into the lunar module, which was really, really cramped, and drive that little thing, which was supposed to be just landed on the moon and left it there. No, I guess they were going off the moon, but it was, uh, it, it was not a, a, a good thing. They actually made a movie out of it, cleverly named Apollo 13. Uh, Ron Howard, Opie, was the director of that, and uh, Tom Hanks was the uh, star of it. I guess he starred as, uh, I guess, uh, Jim Lovell. And Kevin Bacon, I think, was one of the other two. Jack Swagger, or uh, Fred Hayes. Ozzy, I think. I can't read that. Hayes, I think it was. Uh, but that was so close. And there was a very famous quote from that one, too. Houston, we have a problem. Houston was Space Control Center, yeah. Houston, we have a problem, and they did. And then they managed to drive that little unit back. It wasn't designed to be the thing they were driving from. Have you watched that movie live? No. It's, um, I think it's Jim Lovell. Yeah. And he plays a character Got to it. me, it's kind of stupid, but it actually was a fairly decent movie. But at the end, they ended up driving one of those little things back to Earth. Right. It was actually one of those that kind of like tricked you at the end, so it was pretty cool. But yeah. You might want to watch it. Yeah. I haven't seen Apollo 13 either, but I, you know, but they used the quote in that it was actually said, Houston, we have a problem. They used it in the movie, too. Clever. What other countries uh, are explore the moon? Um, well, that last one you see there, Apollo Soyuz mission, that means we were there with, uh, you know, it was the first international space rendezvous uh, coordinated with two spacecraft from different countries. So it's, uh, I don't know if the EU, European Union, I know they have a space agency now, 
but I don't think they've landed on the moon. Now, I think they cooperated uh, with some of our later things, you know, like uh, I know the Mars rover, they've been involved with that. The thing to Saturn, they did almost all of that. And I think they did the one that they tried landing on an asteroid. Uh, and they had a lot of fun with that one because it was, it was so low gravity, they bounced when they hit, you know. So it was, uh, they had to do some uh, adjustment there. Um, I'm pretty sure Japan, I know Japan has cooperated with us. I don't know if they sent up anything independently. And... Uh, Yeah, it, say again? Resources, education. Yeah, yeah. Knowledge. Yeah, so people, they've sort of gotten so they combine things now because of that very reason, yeah. We, it, at first it was, you know, Soviet Union and U.S., you know, in the space race. No one else could afford to be. Uh, and then after both of them started cutting back, we've done much more joint things, which we currently do. Uh, a woman just returned from space recently, didn't she? Longest ever? I think I heard that just in the last week or so. Uh, so, anyway, that's the moon and the Apollo missions. Okay. Let's talk about the actual moon, its composition, its features. Now, this is, to me, really interesting to think of. Remember we said it had lots of craters because there were no atmosphere, so it's been pounded by stuff over billions of years, okay? So the surface, three meters of fine gray dust on the surface. Now what's a meter? A meter is about three feet times six feet, so that's two meters. The ceiling would be close to three meters, maybe a little beyond the ceiling. That much dust. Okay, that's why the, when they were on the moon, they wore the big old flat bottom shoes or, or, or things, because otherwise they would sink down. Yeah, you, you had to be pretty careful. Three meters, nine feet plus. Close to 10 feet of fine gray dust <coughs> on the sur surface of the moon. Accumulated from the first micrometeor impact, small things that hit the moon and stayed there, uh, but also glass beads formed from bigger impacts, and there's so much heat formed, they, they form these, you know, they melt and then recrystallize because of the heat. So, really deep with dust. The rocks are basalts. Now, we haven't talked about them yet. We will next chapter. The basalts are mostly iron-based rocks. They're rocks from molten lava. Okay? Molten, by the way, means melted. And remember we said the Maria were ancient lava flows? Those are all your basalts. Okay? Pretty much that. The light-colored highland rock, they feel like were formed about 4 billion years ago. The darker-colored Maria rocks, those are the uh, basalts, from about 3.1 to 3.8 billion years ago. So, for the first 200 million years, they were mostly light-colored, and I'm guessing, I'm they don't say it here specifically. More of a siliceous rock, sil uh, uh, silicates, okay? And then the it went through about a 600,000, a 600 million year range where they had a lot of volcanic activity. And that's where you had the darker colored volcanic lava flows. Okay, we'll get to that a little bit later. What's the internal structure? Well, you have three meters of fine dust on the surface. When you go from that down to between 65 and 130 kilometers deep, 
This is the outer rock. Now, interesting enough, that part is thickest on the far side of the moon, thinnest on the side toward us. Remember, we only see one face of the moon. The moon goes around us like this. It never spins enough for us to see the backside. It spins one time every revolution. We always see that same face. The darker, the thickest part of the internal structure, the outer rock, is on the far side. Okay? Now, 65, this is the side we see about 65 kilometers thick of outer rock, 130, twice that much on the other side. Okay? Keep this in mind now. All this is leading to something. Now, how many miles are we talking about there? This would be about 40 miles thick here. This would be... Uh, about close to 60 miles uh, thick on the other side. That's not exactly close. 900 kilometers of partly molten iron core. Okay? So, 900 kilometers deep, you start getting this partially melted iron core. That's a lot like us. Our core is molten, melted, and we'll talk about that in a later chapter too, and it's mostly iron. Okay? Theirs is not nearly as big, the moon's is not nearly as big, and not totally melted like our outer core is. It's partially molten. That's because friction, heat, the pressure, rubbing it together so hot it melts the iron. Okay? And that was the source for the volcanic activity that happened earlier. But that has long since ceased. They still have the molten core, but they don't seem to be having any release of that from the middle. So here's the history of the moon, as we understand it now. This is from our information we get from it, speculation, the age of rocks we've tested from there. Stage one was the origin stage. Now, this is a theory. This is the one that they have. They feel like it was formed from material ejected from the Earth after a really major collision. A really major collision actually knocked off material from the Earth. Now this was probably very early in Earth's formation stage too. When we were not quite a planet yet, we were a protoplanet, meaning we were probably still molten on the surface too. So we were a big hot ball of fire, you know, going around, mostly molten, and something hit us and split off some of that. That became the moon. What's that? I know. But that would explain several things. Why would, is the back part thicker than the front part? It was thrown out. That would make sense then. Why does it always face us? That sort of answers that question too. Because it was a part of us and it just keeps going around us that way. What's that? Why does that explain why it faces us? Well, if this blew out and we were spinning and it was spinning, it was going, it would have just kept going around us. It's almost like we're still joined, but not really. Gravitationally, we're joined, but you know, it doesn't spin separate from us. It does exactly the same. So it does explain a fair, fair amount. Okay, that's the theory. Anyway, it's just a theory now. Now, so that's how it got out there. Stage two was the molten surface stage. Okay. Just like Earth, we started out molten on the surface, later that solidified and the molten material was just in the center now. They think about 100 kilometers deep, molten surface, go back here, that would be just about this, right? 
All right, here we have Kedrick. And I can return your first test to you because everyone got that turned in. I think new record as far as the quickest I've gotten a, a test back. Okay? Um, so, like I said, that would be the outer rock. It was about uh, 100 kilometers deep. That's pretty much average of what that was. Now, 200 million years after the formation, this was the molten surface stage, molten surface about 100 kilometers deep, the heating from the solar system debris impacts, okay? Like I said, this was early in our solar system formation. There was lots of things flying around out there, probably way more collisions than what you would imagine. That big one that caused the moon was one of them, but they continued being, and since they were so frequent, the surface stayed hot from those, so it stayed molten for a while, okay? Then it moved down to the molten interior stage, accumulated heat from the radio radioactive decay. Remember the sun, that it was, as it was forming, I mean, a lot of radioactive stuff was happening, being thrown out there. That accumulated heat was from that radioactive decay. That began, and I'm pretty sure they got this wrong. Okay? If you check in your book, You'll see stage three. It says here million. Those are billion. So make that correction. If you're using your notes from the PowerPoint, make sure, let me get my pen set up. These are billion and billion. Okay? And this, again, will be billion. Okay? So... Um, stage three began about, remember they think this was about four billion years, so that first 200 million years, that fits, this was happening. Then from 3.8 billion down to 3.1 billion, that was the molten interior, and that's when you had a lot of volcanic activity. That's when the mar dark maria were formed, okay? And then stage four, which has been the last 3.1 billion years out of the 4 billion years, that's been the longest stage by far, uh, that's to present cold and quiet. Fairly, I think it probably still has some moon quakes. They can register some things, but no volcanic activity, no major stuff like even as much as we have here on the Earth. Okay. Any eruption in that zone? Say that again. Any eruptions coming in that zone? Uh, you mean on the moon or here? Uh, they don't think so. Don't it's think been so. about 3.1 billion years since they had the last one. <laughs> so <laughs> probably <laughs> not too, too uh, likely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the surface now, since the surface is, has uh, uh, hardened like 3.8 billion years ago, now the surface is scarred with the micrometeorites and the other meteorites. You have pounded it into a dust, okay, for most of the surface. That's happened over about 3.1 billion years. Those are Bs for billion, not Ms for million. <laughs> okay, and you'll, if you check in the book, you see that's substantiated there. Whoever did the slides, I guess, did the million here and then thought those Okay. They are billion. All right. Any questions on the moon? History? What we know about it so far. Now let's talk about the Earth moon system. This is the last section of this chapter. Now here's the other. This is all evidence that's sort of supported by this theory. Why in the world do we have the biggest moon relative to our mass? I mean, by far, okay? Yeah, there are bigger moons out there, but they're around Jupiter and Saturn and these planets that are many times bigger than we are. Our moon rates right up with them, you know, in the same general ballpark 
why does our moon so big compared to, to our mass? Well, if it broke off of us, that would account for it. The moon-earth mass ratio is by far the highest of the solar system. Even though the bigger moons out there, they all belong to planets that are enormously larger than Earth. Okay? The diameter is about a quarter of that of Earth. Okay? That is one big moon. Okay? The mass, though, is only about 181st that of Earth. Well, if you think about, if you go from here to four times that, because volume is related to... Uh, or the mass is related to volume, and volume is related to the cube of the diameter. Yeah, that, that sort of makes more sense. If you cube this, you get 1 over 64. Well, it's not quite as dense as, as the Earth materials are, so that makes it down to 1 over 81. It's large enough to affect the Earth's orbit. Okay? We're going around the sun. And if we, if we had no moon, we would just be going really smoothly like this. Because the moon is going around us, we do this kind of thing. Yeah, we're not a nice smooth path. Every time the moon moves around us, it, it wobbles us a little bit in that orbit. Not the wobble of our spin, but the wobble of the orbit. Okay? Uh, the Earth and the moon rotate about a common center of mass. A common center of mass is actually in the Earth, but it's not through the center of the Earth. It's off to the side a little bit, as this figure shows. If our moon were a tiny little thing, our, our motion would be like this. It just moves around. It's really hard to notice. It. But because it's so big compared to us, so massive, not bigger than us, but still massive, the center of mass is what? stays in a straight line and sometime when the moon's over here we're over here when the moon's here we're up here when the moon's here so it's the, the center of mass is the thing that does this they don't have this drawn very well but that's the thing that follows a straight orbit our center of mass and there it is the moon's out here we're here the center of mass is see if it wasn't for the moon our center of mass would be right in the center just pulled it that far over. This is just a draw, so it's not exact. And we spin around that center of mass. So we move around that as well as the moon is moving around us at that. Okay. Now, let's think of the phases of the moon. The phases of the moon are, is what part of the moon are we seeing illuminated? What faces us is, is the same face all the time. But sometimes we only see a little bit of it illuminated. Sometimes we see it all illuminated. Sometimes we see different portions. Result from the changing relative positions uh, of Earth, Sun, and Moon. Okay? So, um, we'll have uh, Rachel being the Sun again. You don't mind, do you? Not too hot, are you? Okay. All right. And say, I'm the Earth, and here's the Moon. Okay, when I'm here, and the Moon's back here, not in my shadow, but you know, you're back here somewhere, then I look at the Moon, the whole face of the Moon that I see is being illuminated by the Sun. If the Moon's over here, I look at the Moon, only this half is being illuminated by the Sun, this half is dark. That's the same face I see here, but I only see this part of it because it's over here. When it's over here, the face of this moon being illuminated by the sun is all toward the sun. All I see is the dark side. I mean, it's the same side I saw, but all of it's dark. None of that's in the light. And then a crescent moon, a half moon, a full moon. They call it three quarters moon, but it's another half moon. And then moon. So as it moves around us, we see a different portion of it being illuminated by the sun. Does that kind of make sense? And that's how we measure our months, basically, by that phase of the moon. And it's not exact. Yes, exactly. 
as the moon, more of it is being illuminated each night, that's called a waxing moon, and as less of it is being illuminated each night, that's a waning moon. So if it's here, that's a new moon, nothing's illuminated. Now just a little bit, more and more, that's a waxing moon. But more is illuminated every night, more gets to be full. Maximum amount. From here, its dial starts getting less being illuminated. So that's a waning moon. Half and then back to sliver to nothing. Okay. So it's a result from the changing relative position of the Earth, Sun, and Moon. The new moon is when it's between us and the Sun, and what we see, none of that part of the moon, that face of the moon, is being illuminated. The first quarter is when we see half a moon illuminated, full moon when we see all of it illuminated, last quarter, full moon. The moon never goes into overtime, never. Uh, as the game last night did twice. Did anyone watch that? I didn't stay up for it. Huh? Hmm? Yeah. Oh, See, all y'all, yeah, that's a typical Alabama. Boy, is there any other conference in the... No, it's all over. Yeah, this is the papers. Yeah, all right. The same side always faces the Earth. That's what we were saying before. Another bit of that evidence that maybe it did come from the Earth. All right. Now, get this picture in mind. Our lab today, we're going to base on something similar to this, not quite the same. The difference is... For some reason, our lab has the sun coming over here, shining here. This is the Earth, now, uh, and therefore, this half would be the part that's lighted. And then the moons, and today's lab will have eight moons, not four. Okay? And they will be, of course, you know, the half that's illuminated is the half toward the sun. Not, you know, just like this, it just has the sun over here. We'll have it here, but... Our lab today will be based, a good portion of it, not all of it, but a good portion of it will be based on a picture just like this, except the sun's going to be on that side, so everything's reversed, and you'll have eight positions of the moon, not four. Okay? So get, get that sort of down in mind. Notice here, always the half of any ball that's toward the sun, that's the half that's being light, lighted, okay, lit. Okay, um, the other half is in darkness, whether it's the Earth or the Moon or whatever. Venus, Mercury, Jupiter, all those, they go through phases just like the Moon does. The only difference is if the Sun's over there, this half will be light, this half dark, on every one of those. Okay, and we'll have four more in between those. Okay. What would you call that one? Say again? Quarter moon? Quarter moon? Not quite. That is probably less. We call that a crescent moon. Just a little bitty bit. Okay? But you can guarantee the thickest part of the crescent, whatever part you see, the thickest part is always toward the sun. So if you have the, the, the tips over here, perpendicular to that, Toward the earth, the sun is there always. Whether it's morning or evening, the part that's lit is toward the sun, obviously. The other part of the moon is there, you just can't see it because it's dark. Okay? That's it. Okay. Now, this, what, the very first day of class, was it? Yeah. Before we met the first time, we had the solar eclipse. Too bad it wasn't just a little bit later. Okay? But here we have two different types of eclipse, eclipses. Eclipses, however you say that. Now, why don't we have an eclipse pretty frequently? Because the moon's orbit is inclined five degrees from that of the Earth's orbit. So if, if Earth is here, the moon is five degrees off of there, it's never going to pass in the shadow of the Earth, okay? Nor will the Earth pass the shadow of the moon, okay? 
okay? It just doesn't happen that frequently. It does happen, but not very frequently. So the moon's orbit, because of that incline five degrees off, very seldom will we have an eclipse. The proper alignment of the Earth, Moon, and the Sun are needed for those eclipses to happen. Now, why is that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One of those reasons is the Earth is much bigger than the Moon, right? Four times the diameter. Didn't we say that? Yeah. Okay. So, the moon, when it's out there, and the moon's fairly close to us, but it's still pretty far away. All right, now I'm going to do something. I don't know if this is going to make a lot of sense. Uh, I'm going to hold my finger up here, and you see a pretty good illustration of a finger. Darkest here, and then there's a little bit of area around that where it's sort of fuzzy. Okay, the closer I get to the light, the fuzzier, the bigger the fuzzier part is. This light is so close it's hard to do. Back when we had a projector a long way away, I could do this a lot better. But then if I get close here, just about all of it is is a is a very dark distinct. You can even see the, the wrinkle in my uh, finger there. Okay? But over here, there's a lot of fuzziness in there. Okay? The dark part is called the umbra. Okay? The fuzzy part is called the penumbra. Okay? Now the distance we're talking about with the sun and the moon are enormous distances. Okay? Now if you picture uh, the sun, remember how big the sun is. Huge. Okay? And the moon is not nearly so big. So when the moon is here and the sun's way, way out there, then its umbra shadow goes down like a cone, okay? The penumbra is a little bit bigger because, you see, that's where... I'll show that in a, in a slide coming up. So that's why they say it's a conical shape, a conical shadow having two parts. The umbra is the inner part of the cone, very dark, complete shadow. The penumbra is the outer part of the cone, and that's a partial shadow, okay? Let's see if they show that in the... Yeah. This doesn't show it too badly. Okay? So here's the moon. The sun's out here now. And here is the shadow of the moon. Okay? This is the pun, the umbrage, umbrage shadow. Okay? Now because of that five degree uh, inclination of the moon's orbit, most of the time, the shadow of the moon doesn't even touch the earth. Nowhere close. Okay? Other times, the moon's on the back side, it's, its shadow couldn't come close to the earth. So most of the time, there's no effect, even when it's out here. The only time it could be is when it's right here, and if it's in one of those five, outside the five degrees, nope, no shadow at all. Okay? What they didn't show, and I wish they had shown, was the earth shadow. It's another cone back here. But because the Earth is bigger, it's a longer cone. And it's much more likely for the moon to revolve into the Earth's shadow than the Earth to move into the moon's shadow. Because the moon's smaller and it doesn't have the... It's tall. Think of them as dunce caps, okay? The moon's dunce cap is not very tall. The Earth's is very tall. That's what we mean by home there. Okay. So what the solar eclipse is, like we had back in August, okay, is where the tip of the umbra actually touches the Earth. And actually it came down across the U.S. from Oregon to South Carolina. Went through Nashville, went through the Tetons. That day you didn't see me probably. I wore my... We had been in the Tetons the week before, Karen, and my wife, had bought me a, an eclipse shirt, so I wore my t-shirt that day on the eclipse, because they had total eclipse on the Tetons, and uh, it was, we were, they were in, and Nashville was in the Umbra. We were, had a little bit of the Umbra, but mostly in the, well, we were in the Penumbra most of the time. 
Okay, but where that tip of the umbra touched the earth, that was the path of the total eclipse. Now, there are some times when the moon, remember, the earth's orbit is not circular. <laughs> it's ellipsed. Sometimes we're closer to the sun, sometimes we're further. Well, the moon's orbit, orbit around the earth is also elliptical. Sometimes the moon's further away, sometimes it's closer. This time, with the close, uh, it was relatively close to us, it had a path that you had totally eclipsed. When the moon's further away, it doesn't quite, the, just the tip doesn't quite touch the earth. And then from the earth, what you see is what they call an annular eclipse. The moon comes in front of the sun, but you can see the fringe of the sun on the outside of the moon. Okay? That's an annular eclipse. It's sort of like a, a ring. The sun is in the middle, but you see, I mean, the moon's in the middle, but you see some of the sun around it. Okay. Now, the lunar eclipse, which they could have shown here if they had shown the Earth's uh, shadow being much longer, any time the moon crosses into the Earth's shadow, and that would be, oh, okay. Let's back up a minute here. Remember the sun's out here, according to this. It's over here so far. So what kind of moon is it that we, when we see a solar eclipse? Always. A new, uh, new moon. Solar eclipse is a new moon because the moon is here. The side of the moon being illuminated is away from us. All we see is the dark side. It's the same side we always see, but it's dark side. Okay? When it's a lunar eclipse, when the sun passes into our shadow, that's always the full moon. And then you'll see part of it go dark, uh, or all of it go dark, and then it, re it passes in and out of the Earth's shadow. And it will be, it'll be total lunar eclipse far more frequently than you'll see a total solar, solar eclipse. And that's given in a table in your text, I think, at least in the old edition it was. All right, here we go. Here is a total solar eclipse. The sun here. Okay, the umbra is formed when no rays from the sun get by the moon. That's the umbra, and that was the path that went from Oregon to South Carolina. That path cut across like this. The penumbra, and this is, they don't show the earth big enough, well, the sun's way further away, so the, the angles aren't right, but the penumbra would be when you see a partial eclipse. We were somewhere here or somewhere we were down here. We saw most of the eclipse, but not the total eclipse, because we were in the penumbra. Okay? Some of the Earth's rays, these rays did get to us, but these rays here did not. Okay, so those were the in the penumbra. Here, no ray from either side got to the, that little strip across the Earth, and that was where they had the total solar eclipse. Okay? Again, they have the Earth way too big, to this way too big, the Sun way too close, and way too small. I mean, you'd have to get, well, you couldn't fit it on the board if, and see anything that made sense. Okay? But on the other hand, do the same thing with the Sun here, make the Earth smaller, of course. And then its umbra, the moon can easily be inside the Earth's umbra. And uh, in the Earth's line, she can be in the penumbra as well. But that's a total lunar eclipse. This occurs on new moons. Lunar eclipses occur on full moons. Always. Always. Okay, any questions about eclipses? Solar eclipse or lunar eclipse? Okay, before we move into tides, here's a few moon mistakes, myths, mistakes, and misunderstandings. Common un misunderstanding that the Earth's shadow creates the monthly moon phases. No, it, it creates eclipses of the moon, lunar eclipses, and those all are over in one night, in a few hours in one night. That doesn't account for the other. That's the part being shown, lit by the sunlight. 
The phrase a blue moon is not a reference to the color of the moon. Instead, it is a reference to the extra full moon that occurs in a season. Remember we said the lunar period is about 20, what would we say, 28 and a half days? Or 20, what is that? All right, here it is, 29 and a half days. That means most months you'll see one phase of the moon twice. You may see one on the, say, let's just, okay, round this to 29 for right now, okay? Say you saw a new moon on day one, well, 29 and a half days later, which would be the 30th or the 31st, you're going to have another new moon, or a full moon, or a half four, you know, whatever. Some phase will be repeated at the front and end. Only in February will you not have but one phase, and you won't even see all of the phases there. But in every other month, you'll have a partial phase. Whatever you had the first day, you're going to have the last day or two. Next one of those last two days. When that happens to be a full moon on the first day of the month, and then another full moon on the one of the last two days of the month, that is what we call a blue moon. Okay? Uh, there's not a slide on that, but that's on page 426. So when they say happens once in a blue moon, that's not calling about the color of the moon. That's on a month when you have two full moons in a month. Okay? It seemed like if they call it blue moon, that should be two new moons in a month, but you don't ever see those anyway, so that's what we mean by that. A very long period of time, because it just doesn't happen that frequently. Let me get back where we were. All right. Number three, a popular myth has more accidents happening during a full moon phase. However, studies have found that no significant statistically significant relationship happens there. They feel like it's probably a result of, on the full moon, most people will remember that, whereas a half moon or partial moon and stuff, they don't pay any attention to it. Oh, but that was on the full moon. Oh, you know, we were in an accident. Yeah, it they just noticed the moon that day. Now, that being said, I do believe there's something to do with What's another term for someone who's a little crazy? A lunatic. Where does that come from? The moon. We had a neighbor who was really, something was wrong with the guy. And he usually, not every month, but when he had a major blow up and stuff, you could almost track it by the face of the moon. He uh, poured acid on other neighbors' cars. He threw rocks through people's windows. He didn't do it all the time, but just about every time he did, it was awfully close to the full moon. And I've heard people in emergency uh, responders, people who worked in emergency rooms, stuff like that, say, yep, you can count on it. On full moons, you're going to have more weird stuff happening. Yeah. Now, My mom no. works at the hospital right here. She works on the sixth floor. That's where all the crazy people are. She says it's awful. Is that right? Yeah. Well, and I'm just going to tell you, I park in and wait tables. And when it's a full moon, like, I can burn my place down because people come in, they're grouchy, and everything just chaotic. Like, it's a real thing. <laughs> so, I don't know if anyone's done any study of that. Maybe more accidents don't occur then. They say they don't. But there's a lot more lunatic activity on those full moons, it seems like. I just wanted to point those out because I was sort of refuting, not exactly what he said, but there is something going on with that. All right, then the next issue of the Earth-Moon system is our tides, okay? And it's not the roll tides type either, CC. Okay. Uh, okay. Our tides result from different gravitational pulls on the front and back of the Earth. A 
Okay? Now, who do you think pulls on us? The moon and a little bit the sun. Okay? The moon's the dominant. It's closer. Three factors. The earth, moon, sun positions. The spring tides has nothing to do with the time of year. Spring tides mean the alignment is there. So if Rachel is the sun, and here's the moon back here and I'm the earth, and when they were lined up this way or this way, then we have maximum, those are your spring tides. Your neap tides are when the moon is here or here relative, and here's the earth. Now the moon's pulling this way, but the sun's pulling that way. Moon still wins, but it's not added to the sun. The sun is subtracted from on the neap side. So those will be the le lesser of the tides. The maximum tides occur when, the, when they're aligned, either the moon on the opposite side of the earth or on the same side. It doesn't matter, but they're lined up. Now, another factor. The elliptical orbit of the moon. I've already mentioned that. Just like we form an elliptical orbit around the sun, the moon does elliptical orbit around us. The greatest pull is when they're closest to us. That's the perigee. The less effect is at the apogee. So, if the moon's closest to us on the neap tide, that will be a larger neap tide. Farther from us on a spring tide, there'll be a lesser spring tide than we would otherwise. And all throughout there, that's the second feature. How close is the moon to us and it's based on that elliptical plane? There's a 448,000 kilometer difference. Remember, hang that thought, 48,000 kilometer difference. Remember how far was the Earth from 380,000 kilometers away. So that's more than a tenth of that distance. So that's a pretty significant percentage. It's about an eighth or a ninth of the total distance. That's the difference that you could have in between the apogee and the perigee. Perigee and apogee. Let me get back on it. Oh, here we go. Too far. Okay. And then the third thing is in strictly to do with the earth. The amount of the tide is the shape, size, and depth of the water basin. Okay? The lowest tide variation is in our good old Gulf of Mexico. <coughs> That's a big, fairly, at least near the shore, fairly shallow and stuff. You only have about a third of a meter. That's about a foot difference in your tides, okay? Now that would be a lot further going in and out. The Bay of Fundy, which I think is in Nova Scotia, I believe it is, 15 meters? A third of a meter is about a foot, okay? 15 meters would be, remember I said this floor is about three meters high? That's a five-story building, the difference between Low tide and high tide in the Bay of Fundy. How do you how do you prepare for something like that? You know, I think they have docks and things like this that go up very tall poles, five story high poles, and everything has to go up and down that way. And then you, I, I don't even know how they do it. Okay, that's the uh, maximum. Unbelievable. Let me get that. I'm pretty sure that's Nova Scotia. Um, yeah, Bay of Fundy in Nova Scotia. All right, now there was a... Ah, here is the illustration on the gravitational pull. I should have had this up earlier. Now again, the moon is the big deal. When the moon is over here, the moon is pulling the earth that way, right? Okay. Now, because the water is fluid, it gets pulled more easily than the solid earth does. But then the earth gets pulled too. So on the back side, the, the earth gets pulled and some of the water pulls away. So you have maximum tide here and here at the same time. 
okay, uh, on the sides not go 90 degrees from the, the thing, that's when you'll have to blow ties here. And as it moves, you know, very safe. So the tidal bulge is left behind the Earth, and also the tidal bulge toward the Moon. Now, if the Sun is also there, or there, that that gives you your spring tides, and they're a little bit greater. When the sun is here and here, or some other place 90 degrees from that, then it's pulling the water and the earth a little bit more, so it reduces that map, and that'll give you new tides. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, that's the last slide they showed. Let me, I uh, should have said this, I'm sorry I got sidetracked a little bit. Let's go back to the eclipses, so this will be, whoops, here. The total eclipse is visible from the U.S., visible from the U.S., from 2010 to 2025, two, two total solar eclipses. One we just had, August 21st, 2017. The next one will be April the 8th, 2024. I won't be here teaching at that time because <laughs> I'll be retired by then, okay? I hope I'll still be alive and kicking, or at least moving my foot a little bit, maybe not kicking. Uh, hopefully I'll live to see that one. But look how many total lunar eclipses we have in that same time frame. We had two in 2014, two in 2015, and we had a three-year period we didn't have much, 2018, coming up in January 31st, my niece's birthday, um, we'll have a total lunar eclipse at moon set. And when does the moon set? Well, which kind of moon do we have at a a lunar eclipse, full moon. And when does the full moon set? If it's opposite the sun, and the sun's rising, the moon set. Because it's all based on the spin of the earth. So when the sun rises, that would be the moon set. Am I going to be up at that time of morning to see it? Probably not. I'll be getting dressed or something, okay? Okay, that's, yeah, especially in January. I'm not going to get up before, well, I'll be up before sunrise. And then the next year, almost a year later, another one. Uh, it says all visible. It doesn't say when, it says all visible. Um, then it skips a couple of years, and then one in 2021, one in 2022, and skips three years, 2025. So what is that? Three, six, nine lunar eclipses for total lunar eclipse for only two solar eclipses. So that's probably about the right ratio. Okay. Now, I don't want to get too much into political stuff here, but you know, there's a huge portion of people who say that science really isn't science. They say, fake science, all that kind of stuff. They predicted this solar eclipse, I would say decades ago. They knew all these variations, the, the five degree you know, thing, you know, all this other, the, they predicted it right to the day, years and years ago. That's what science can do. So don't give me this tough about Science being, oh, well, this is just someone's opinion. What you want to bet, we'll have another one on April 8, 2024. I bet you they have it down to the day. Science can do that. Okay, I'm sorry. My little <laughs> soapbox there, okay? And it just irritates me when politicians, ah, oh, that's fake science. You know. How long does it take? Okay. There are some pretty good examples. I won't spend any time on that. For some reason, they chose, and he's a good guy, the people behind the science, Carl Sagan. 
I don't know. Do y'all remember who Carl Sagan, Sagan was? There was a show on public television called Nova. And he was the host of that. It was on once a week or something like that, periodically anyway. And he he was a good astronomer. I'm sure he was, okay? But he wasn't top of his field, but he was a fantastic science communicator. And that's why they had him on there. And uh, he knew what he was talking about, uh, but they featured him. He died back in 96, so I guess most of y'all were born then, weren't you? I got really almost freaked out when when I announced to the class, one of my classes, something about having a mild form of leukemia. And they said, well, how long have you had it? I said, well, it was first diagnosed in 91. And several students said, I wasn't born then. <laughs> I went, yeah, you know, I realized how old I was. Okay. So 96, maybe some of you weren't born then. I don't know. All right. A few of you probably were. Okay. That ends the chapter. I'll say it every chapter. Nothing replaces reading the chapter. Okay. Really, it's a good idea to do it before we talk about it in class rather than afterwards, but it's still beneficial to read it. You get more out of reading it before, even though you may not be understanding it all, don't let it bog you down, just read it. And then when we talk about it in class, your brain will start putting things together. Whereas if you wait until in class, that's the first time you've heard, then it's not making a lot of sense, and you may not ever get the synapses to tie together. So it's a good idea to, to read ahead, okay? The summary at the end is pretty good. This is one of the longer summaries, I think, of all the ones. It's better than half a page, not quite three-quarters of a page, but you know, pretty good. Then look at the key terms here. Wow, that's about the longest list I can remember of any of the chapters. Applying the concepts, a fantastic thing to study, I think, for your test. And that's 47 questions here. You're not going to have 47 questions on a test. They won't be the same questions, but I can almost guarantee you the majority of the questions in the test will be the same material that's being asked about here, but probably in different ways. So 47, they give you the answers. As far as I know, these answers are probably correct. I, that's on pages 431 through 433. Uh, some of the earlier editions we would find periodically errors. The later editions, I've, I, I haven't taught from this one that much, but uh, so far I haven't run into many errors in that. I think they got most of them correct. Questions for thought. Again, 30 is one of the larger numbers I can remember, so those are not bad to look at. Of course, they don't give the answers there. You have to look those up. For further analysis, 6, that's about average, maybe a little bit more. And then the parallel exercises, if you had done the examples in the text, then you'll find the parallel exercises interesting and probably worthwhile, but I'm not assigning those. The, if you have the full book, the answers for group A are in the back. For the group B, they are not. Okay. And 15 questions. That probably about normal for these chapters we're doing now. Any questions then on chapter 16? Okay. So again, Thursday, right now, I would say be prepared for the test on Thursday, last 30 minutes uh, of class on Thursday. What we're going to do now is begin chapter 17, and when it gets to be 3.45, okay, which is about 45 minutes from now, we'll stop chapter 17 and have the lab from 16. Actually, it'll be the first lab from 16. The second will actually be the lab from the first three chapters will be our trip to the planetarium, if I can get it arranged. And if I have time when I get to, uh, he won't be in the office soon, I don't think. I'll try to call tomorrow afternoon at 3.15, and uh, when I'm back in the office, to try to arrange the planetarium visit. So hopefully, we can get that done. I doubt if it'll be Thursday. That would be the only reason I'd say the test probably will be Thursday. If he says, no, come, you know, from 
three to five on, on Thursday, we won't have time to do the, the test. So I don't think he'll say that, but he usually likes to get us in earlier and get us out earlier, so he can go home. Okay. All right. All right, let's move on to chapter 17. So that pretty much ends the astronomy part of the course. Now we part, start the part that I would call geology or earth science. Okay, And actually, part of what we were doing was earth science. Part of it was geology. But this is really where that hits. Okay, uh, The last two things will be meteorology and oceanography. But that's going to be one chapter each. So this is actually the biggest group of chapters, four chapters on geology or earth science. Okay. The first of these are rocks and minerals. Okay. And a beautiful picture of chrysotil, I believe is the name of no, rhodochrysite. Okay. Rhodochrysite. Okay. Uh, beautiful crystals that you see. And those are naturally occurring. I'm sure people can make them. But that was a naturally occurring. You can tell it's on the foundation of other rock here. These crystals just basically grew there. Okay. The core concept of the chapter is the Earth is a dynamic body that cycles rocks and minerals in ongoing, through ongoing changes. Everything is always changing. We'll see this concept in this chapter in most of the subsequent chapters, everything is always cycling through a process. This rock here is one of the oldest rocks they think they've discovered on the planet. And it is an example of a rock that, believe it or not, you see these layers here? Those are one time flat. Okay? And what has happened, the rock has undergone so many stresses and strains it actually has changed form so many times, uh, and we'll talk about this later in the chapter. That rock will show back up again. A very, very old rock. It's a metamorphic rock. We'll talk about that later as well. Okay. So let's start with the earth solid materials, the first topic in the chapter. Now notice we're talking about the solid earth materials. We're not talking about the oceans. That'll be chapter 24. We're talking about the solid earth materials. We have a non-uniform distribution of matter. Okay. Now we know we have solids on the continents and liquids, so your solids are underneath the oceans in other places, uh, but you still have non-uniform distributions of materials. Not just where they're located, but what kinds of materials. For instance, as we mentioned before, the moon, the moon has a partially molten core. We have a molten core, and it contains most heavy elements. Iron, nickel, and mostly stuff that's heavier than iron and nickel. Iron and nickel are the two predominant ones, but most of the other stuff are uh, heavier than those. Okay? Where we live is a very thin surface crust. These are mostly lighter elements. Oxygen, carbon, uh, magnesium, potassium, silicon, pretty light type elements. The heavier elements, iron, nickel, and heavier, they're in the core. So that's what it means, non-uniform distribution of matter. Okay? But get this. In our little thin surface crust, only eight elements out of if you got your big text go to the back cover you'll see they list here about 118 elements well really not all some of those are unnamed they just project they're out there somewhere uh, but of the ones we know about that goes up to probably 92 maybe a few more than that let's just say around 100 only eight of these elements make up 98.6% of the crust. Okay, 
and uh, it's very cute. We'll be able to have a graphic on that in a minute. The rocks and the minerals make up the solid crust materials. Okay, rocks and minerals. We haven't distinguished what's a rock and what's a mineral yet. We're going to get to that. Even though the name of the chapter is rocks and minerals, we're actually going to do it in reverse order. We're going to do the minerals first and then the rocks. But we'll get there. Let's look at the breakdown. Okay. This is the Earth's crust. Now we're talking solid materials here in the crust. And what's the biggest one? Silicon. Bigger? Oh, sorry. Oxygen. Is oxygen usually a solid? No, 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 no. You're absolutely right. No, we think of oxygen being a gas. But guess what? Name some solid material you know about. Wood. Say again? Wood. Wood. Anything in the world? Yeah. Okay, wood is, is a solid material. It's organic. That has probably for every, and the main, you might say the main thing in organic would be carbon. But probably for every carbon, you probably have two to three oxygens in that wood as well. Even though it's solid. I was just going to say, most everything is made of it. The same molecular phase. Right, well, on the Earth's crust, eight elements make up 98.6% of that crust. Okay, and there they are. Oxygen being the number one of the solid material. Now, oxygen in our atmosphere, about 20% of our atmosphere, 18 to 20, something like that, but it's 48% of the solid materials. Let's think of some other. How about a sand grain, right? Sand grain, anyone know what the elements are in a sand grain? Sodium. Pretty much. Say again? Sodium. Not sodium. Silicon. And oxygen. SiO2, SiO3, SiO4. There's going to be twice as much oxygen there as there's going to be silicon. Or three times. Okay, another one, limestone. You've heard of limestone, right? A lot of Alabama is under the about limestone. That's a carbonate, CO3. Three times the oxygen for every carbon that's in that. Now you have sodium, I mean, uh, uh, calcium and magnesium carbonates, too tight. So they're in there too, but still more oxygen than anything else. Okay? Um, silicate, that's what it was, the sand grain, carbonate, sulfates, just about everything that has an ATE in it, or an ITE, those are, contain oxygen, okay? Uh, if you hear iron oxide, there's iron, but there's also oxygen. In fact, most of the time, more oxygen than there is iron, okay? It's all over the place. So almost half of the solid material of the earth is oxygen. Almost half. 48.6.6%. After that, in the surface of the earth, the crust of the earth, silicon. More than a quarter. So those two alone, almost three quarters of the earth's solid material is made up of two elements. Silicon and oxygen. Okay? Then number three is aluminum. Okay? That's less than 10%. Number four is iron. Sure, we're in the iron area. The iron belt, the uh, iron mining that was done here. Look, that's just little bits of stuff. Iron has made its way to the surface, usually through volcanic activity or something like that. Okay? Calcium's next. I mentioned that with, with uh, the carbonates. The limestone is mostly calcium carbonate. Um, if you know what your sulfates are, um, gypsum is calcium sulfate, okay, and you have you know, some of that. Uh, appetite, which they do phosphate mining, calcium. I mean, calcium is in on a lot of those. So that again, that's less than four uh, percent, okay. Sodium. So I mentioned sodium. Sure enough, that's in the top eight, but it's down to two point eight percent. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven would be potassium and eight would be magnesium. Everything else, all the other 92 major elements are in 1.4% of the crust. There's just not a lot of it there. Yeah, there's a little bit of uranium, but it's rare. 
A little bit of gold, but it's rare. A little bit of silver, it's rare. The others is just really small. Most of it's oxygen, silicon, aluminum, and so on. Now, if you go to the whole Earth, which includes, you know, our crust is just a little thin bit there. The whole Earth, which includes the core and everything else, look who moves into number one. Iron. A third of the whole Earth is iron. Most of that's in the core. Okay, a little bit in the surface of the crust, but most of it's in the core. After that, sure enough, is oxygen. Not only, well, that's mostly in the crust, but there's oxygen throughout. Silica drops down to 15%. Magnesium jumps up to almost 14%, where that was barely number eight up here. It's number four down, whole earth wise. Nickel, number five, didn't even show up. That was part of the other up here. Okay. But in the core, iron and nickel are the common ones. So you don't find much nickel outside the core. There is some, but not a lot. Calcium dropped from number, what was that, five to six, okay? Aluminum dropped from three to seven, and sodium dropped from whatever it was, six to eight or whatever. And then everything else, including potassium and others that were there, you just don't have much. The sodium, I mean, that's almost another two. 0.2 percent. I mean, that's that's tiny. Okay. So that's what the solids are made from. <laughs> Oxygen. Okay, which is not solid, but combined with it. Because frankly, if it weren't for those little green leaves out there, there wouldn't be much oxygen in our atmosphere. Because oxygen combines with just about everything. But what those little green leaves do, they pull the oxygen out of the carbon dioxide in the, uh, in the air and release the oxygen, and therefore we are able to breathe. If it weren't for them, there wouldn't be enough oxygen in our atmosphere for us to be here. They came first. Okay. They're number one. We're here because of them. Okay. Because oxygen combines with just about everything. All right, so there's our solid earth materials. Now we move into 17.2 minerals. Okay. What is, this is maybe not a formal definition, but a pretty good working definition of what a mineral is. Earth science definition of a mineral. A naturally occurring, hang on to that concept, naturally occurring, inorganic. Hang on to that concept. Solid, that's important, element or compound. Now, what we were talking about before were elements. Those things were listed were elements. Most of those do not exist as elements. They exist as compounds. Carbonates, calcium carbonates, potassium, uh, uh, magnesium carbonate, calcium uh, sulfide, sulfate, magnesium sulfate. You know, sodium bicarbonate, I mean, whatever you've got, it's always, almost always, as a compound. Two or more things mixed together. Things that were so, uh, gases now become solids because they combine with other things. So there are solid elements or compounds with a crystalline structure, the other key ingredient on what is a mineral. Okay? Now, what it can't be cannot be synthetic, okay? I, uh, when I first started teaching here at Western State Technical College, they wanted me to teach math and physics, okay? That was the job I applied for. Um, I had more than 18 graduate credit hours in math already, but in physics, I was a few hours short, okay? I had quite a few, but not enough, okay? So I went back to UAB that first year I taught here. I was a full-time temporary instructor because I didn't quite meet the qualifications. So I took courses while I was teaching here full-time, and I took physics courses. My advisor, I never took a class from him, my advisor was a guy 
who did made artificial diamonds. Okay? Real diamonds are minerals. These diamonds met every other qualification except they weren't naturally occurring, they were synthetic, synthetic diamonds. Okay? And the studies were how to do these, how to do them fairly cheaply. Uh, they didn't ever make big ones, okay? They were always pretty small. Where would you have a reason to have very small diamonds? Second? Jewelry. Okay. Jewelry? Jewelry. Jewelry? Actually, you want bigger ones for jewelry. I mean, you might have little things in there. Uh, well, like for the dust, for like drills. Okay, yes. very good. Uh, diamond tip blades, they will cut through anything. Okay? Whereas if you have metal, sometimes it won't cut through harder metal. Concrete, things like this. But if you have diamond tip, yeah, you'll cut through anything. It's the hardest substance out there. So that's what they use it mostly for, as far as I know. I'm, I've never got any further research. Cannot be synthetic. Not directly produced by a living organism. That's why wood would not be a mineral, because it comes directly out of trees. Very directly out of trees. Even though it's solid, even though it has all these other things, it's not. It's not inorganic, it's organic, coming directly from a living organism, okay? And then the last thing, it must have a regular repeating pattern, that's the crystal structure, okay? Now, the dentine in your teeth has a very regular crystal structure. Uh, it's a solid material, but it's organic. It came from living things. So that would not be a mineral, okay? Your fingernail, okay? Hard, you know, material, but it's not, wouldn't be counted as a mineral, okay? It must have a regular repeating pattern. How about the glass there? Would that be a mineral? No. Why not? Okay. It actually was made from crystals. Have you ever seen anyone make glass? What do they use? They, yeah, they start with sand, which is natural. That is a mineral. Sand is silica, silica, you know, silicon dioxide. You know, it is made out of naturally occurring, you know, things. But then they take that silicon, heat it up, melt it, and then shape it the way they want it to shape, and then cool it real quickly. It doesn't go back to a crystal structure. When it was in the sand, it was in a crystal structure. When it's in glass, it is not. So on two counts. One, it what is man-made, but number two, it's not a crystal structure. Okay? Must have a regular repeating pattern. The example I give is halite. Now that's sodium chloride. Now, anyone know what sodium chloride is? Probably has some, okay. If you go by the materials, sodium, anyone know what sodium is? It's salt. Okay. Sodium chloride is salt, table salt, that's sodium wow. chloride. But it's made up of two elements, sodium and chlorine. Sodium is a highly reactive solid, very soft solid, it's sort of a whitish to yellowish powder type thing, not very solid at all, but if you ever saw any pure sodium, it's going to be in a, probably a jar or a container covered with oil. Why do you think it would have to be covered with oil? It probably would burn you, wouldn't it? It would burn you like crazy because you are made mostly of what? What's the number one ingredient? Water. You're mostly water. If sodium ever comes in contact with water, it explodes gives off enormous amounts of heat. So here you have a soft metal that's highly re reactive with water. Combining with chlorine, what is chlorine? I don't know, I know it's because stuff that you wash clothes with. Okay, yeah, that's Clorox, which is made from chlorine, exactly. But where, what is the chlorine? Second? 
Okay, that that's Clorox again. Okay, and that is that's the same type of stuff. What the reason they use chlorine in the pool is to kill germs. Okay, okay, that's yeah. what chlorine is is a green poisonous gas. So here you have a soft whitish yellowish. Uh, highly reactive metal that explodes in the presence of water mixed with a green poisonous gas. But when they're combined chemically, they're no longer a metal, no longer a gas, no longer poisonous, no longer explosive. It's now what you saw in your food when you get it flavor. And you can eat it very safely. So chemical reactions change everything. Well, here's how halite now this is naturally occurring sodium chloride, okay? It's a cubic structure, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And you have sodium ions and chlorine ions. Now, they've shown here the sodium ions as little green dots, and chlorine ions as little blue dots. Now, if they really showed these correctly, the sodium ion would be fairly small, and the chlorine ion would be big. Okay, now, do we need to take a break? It seems like some of us do. Let's take a five minute break. We'll come back and wrap this up. Because I know we y'all been sitting a long time. I get to move around some, but I don't see how y'all do it. All right, as soon as we get the light back. I'm a little too slow. Like I was saying before, the atoms don't quite look like this. They're not really atoms. They're actually ions in this case. Now what makes an ion, an atom into an ion, is that if an atom has an unequal charge, then it becomes an ion. For instance, sodium, that soft metal I was talking about, that is neutrally charged sodium atoms. In uh, salt, sodium or halite, sodium chloride, you have a positively charged sodium ion because it's lost an electron. Chlorine, on the other hand, has gained an electron. So because sodium's lost an electron, its nucleus is one more positive charge than the electron cloud around it has a negative charge. So that actually pulls the electron cloud closer. So that makes for a smaller sodium ion, and that should be smaller for the chlorine ion because it's gained an electron, so it's gotten a little bigger. Those electrons, there's more of them than there are positive charges in the electron in the nucleus, so therefore that expands a little bit because they get further apart from each other. So this would be a little sodium and a big chlorine, but it would still be in this structure. Now, there's an error on here. Does anyone detect where that error occurs? The example. Say again? The example. And what about it? It's the wrong one. No, no, no. It's the right one, but there's a color error. Okay. This right here should be green because, you see, every sodium is connected only to a... Sodium is connected only to chlorines, and every chlorine is only to sodiums. But this sodium uh, chlorine is connected to three so chlorines, which it shouldn't be. And that should be a sodium there, green. And that would be predicted that and that and that one and that one below, which you don't see. Okay? So they did get a color off a little bit here. They got it right in your book. They got it corrected by that time, but this came earlier. So the point here being that this is a very regular crystal pattern. Sodium chlorine, sodium chlorine, sodium chlorine, sodium chlorine. The ions are in there. Now really they should say, no, no, that's okay. Uh, sodium ion, chlorine ion. Okay? Uh, so it's a solid, naturally occurring. Now the table salt you use, the odds are that's been synthesized a little bit anyway probably 
uh, dissolved and then recrystallized. So that would be sort of pushing it to say it would be a mineral. It's halite, though, occurring in nature. That what would do they be mean a by iodized salt? What's that? Iodized salt. Okay, what they have then is a little bit of iodine, um, and I don't know whether it's substituted into the lattice or just added to it. And what they have, the reason for that, let me see if I can remember. Um, borders. The, uh, is it the thyroid? No, what is gland? It's under here. Second? Is it the thyroid that's under here? If it gets, uh, if you have insufficient iodine, you can have uh, a gorder, which is an enlarged thyroid gland. And, uh, and that's why they put iodized, iodine into salt, because everybody uses salt in there. That's to cut down on people having gorders, which is an enlarged thyroid gland. But uh, it's just trace amounts of it. Okay. So let's look at the crystal structures. They can be made up of one or more kinds of elements, okay? For instance, diamond is carbon only, okay? That's the only element in a pure diamond. A pure diamond is going to be crystal clear as well. So if you have a diamond that's a little bit yellowy or, or chocolate diamond or, you know, a ruby diamond or something like that, it's got some impurities in it. But most of it is pure carbon. Okay, quartz, on the other hand, that's another really pretty crystal, is a combination of silicon and oxygen. So that would be a compound. This would be an element made up of one and only one uh, element. Okay? Now, how do we classify these crystal structures? They're based on what they call the surface symmetries. Now, don't fret about having to memorize these. You don't. But this is just for illustrative purposes so you can see what, how these things are done. Here are the six major systems. Isometric, and by the way, the, the, pref the suffix, or the, the root metric <laughs> means to measure. Iso means, is the prefix meaning the same. So these are things that have the same measurement in every dimension. Isometric. Hexagonal, hexa means six-sided, so some type of this structure is a six-sided figure, okay? Tetragonal is a four-sided figure, okay? Orthorhombic, what a rhombus is, is a four-sided structure with equal sides, but not equal angles, and orthorhombic would then be something to do with can't remember exactly what ortho, but I think it has to do with somewhat being similar. Monoclinic, mono means one, but what the clinic stands for, I have no idea. And triclinic. And when you see these, you'll see what's one and what's three. I don't know. Uh, but these are the six basic structures. Now, again, you don't have to know them, don't memorize them, you know, but just to give you an example of how things are put together. So here are Four examples of isometric crystals. The sodium chloride, the halite we were looking at, that's a cubic structure. Every side has the same length, approximately. Isometric, same metric. Okay? And not only are the four sides the same, all the angles are the same. And that makes for a cube. Okay? Now, hard to believe, but the octet octahedron here is also isometric, I mean isometric meaning each side, each one of these triangles is an equilateral triangle. Equilateral means all the sides are the same. Now these sides would then be the same because they're the same as the other. And on the other side you have the same thing, so you have a total of eight sides, that's octahedrons, sides, and all of them are the same dimension, same length. Now obviously the angles aren't quite the same, but that's okay. That's the octahedral structure. 
Here's the tetragonal structure, okay? Four equal sides, okay? Now we have tetragonal, tetragonal system. We're going to get to that in a minute. But this is the tetrahedron. It's a isometric. It has four equal sides. Again, these are four iso... Uh, equilateral triangles and they're put together you got four of them one on the base here one here one there one there so you have four sides they're all equal they may not look at here but that's just because of the dimension the, the angle of it so that's an isometric structure that's a tetragonal structure your uh, silica silicon dioxide your your, your, your quartz crystal, those are usually tetrahedrons, okay? And then this is a dodecahedron, okay? That, I believe, is a 12-sided figure. Let's see if I can count that right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I think there's 12 of that. I think that's what they're counting. Kind of and all, each of these links are the same. Now, this is a tough thing to see visually. Looks like that's sinking into it, but it really is a coming out. It's not an easy thing to, to picture. Okay, that's a dec, de, the decahedron. Okay, so those are for your isometric. The hexagonal, well, these are six sided crystals one, two, three, four, five, six, or like a stop sign from the top and bottom, and then six sides. Connecting or stop signs eight. It may be eight, so maybe not stop signs, but that kind of thing. Now this one is a rhombohedron. Remember, rhomb is like a cube, equal sides but not equal angles. But because you have six sides, one, two, three, four, five, six, it is a hexagonal structure. But it's a rhombohedron. The angles aren't the same. It's a lot like a cube, only the angles are not. This is the tetragonal structure, one, two, three, four sides, with four triangles at the top. Now these probably are isosceles, I mean probably are equilateral, these are probably isosceles triangles at the top, to make it work. Now, orthorhombic, I don't know what makes orthorhombic. Supposedly, it doesn't look like these are equal sides, so that's not really a rhombus, okay? But the angles probably are equal. That probably is what they're referring to. But I I can't explain that one at all. It's just there. This is a monoclinic. And again, this one makes no sense to me. What's mono about that? I have no idea. Mono usually means one. I don't know what they mean by that. And triclinic, it sure doesn't look like three of them of anything. So I can't explain those, but these, the idea is different ways that crystal structures are put together, okay? Uh, the, uh, remember I said your silicon dioxide are in tetrahedral things, the silica in the middle and four oxygens around the sides. That's what makes it a tetrahedral structure. Uh, but it's not SiO4, it can be, but usually two of these are shared with the next adjacent silicon, so it doesn't come out exactly four to one because it's, a lot of them are shared with, between different ones. But that's just to give you, nature is beautiful. It can be all these incredible shapes and, and, and ways things are put together, and that's what makes it so unique. All right, here is a picture, and I don't know if you're... What's that? Oh, is it 345? It is. So we will pick up on crystal structures next time. That will be the beginning of page 439. Okay. And uh, this is a fairly long chapter, not super long. Um, I think we may be able to finish it next time. I can't swear to it. Uh, but we'll have to finish in two hours if we're going to have a lab because the last 30 minutes will be uh, 
the test, so we may not finish it next time, but we'll get going. Let me go on and mark the roll for the second half. Here, okay. Still learning names and faces here. Hunter hasn't come in. Lashandra's well, still here. Rachel's still here. Trey has not come in, has he? Okay. Ray is still here. Jarell is still here. CC is still here. H2. Anthony hasn't made it in today, has he? Okay. Sean is still here. Yes. Is there a way I can take the ride home? Yeah, I mean, all of you get to take it home, but you mean to work on it? Huh? I got it, so. Okay. Um, you'll need to listen to it here, and I think you'll be able to get most of what I say, uh, so you have to listen to it on screencast o matic or whatever you call it. We finish this. Fred's still here. Chelsea is still here. Sam's still here. Nick is still here, but leaving soon. Melba's still here. Willie's still here. Lisa's still here. Kara didn't make it in today, did she? See her. Unhill didn't make it in today yet. Ashlyn's still here. And Kedrick is still here. Okay, glad y'all managed to stay. Um, let me pass out the labs to you. Um, and I'm going to turn this off for now. A little bit later. If CC, if you'll turn on the light there, we'll all get lights. Okay. <laughs> This, like I said before, is, okay, sorry about that folks who weren't here, I didn't know that it wasn't recording, okay, uh, you'll have to read it, check with your classmates, uh, hopefully they're trustworthy and they'll give you the good information, okay. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to draw it the way it is in the on your lab. It's just very similar to the figure you had in the text. By the way, this was uh yeah. I got to do something to keep my pages in order. Um, this is very similar to the figure you had on page 426. If you got this book, it's just turned around on you. Okay? So here we have the sunlight. Well, let me get the... Okay. Here we have the sun coming in like this. The sun's so far away, we count the rays of the sun as being parallel. Okay? So the sunlight rays are coming like this. Now they've drawn the earth for you already. And the half of the earth that's facing the sun is lighted and the other half is in dark, right? Now they've drawn eight moons around here, okay? It's actually one moon at eight different positions or phases. Those are supposed to be circles. My circles aren't very good. Okay, the, Okay. and by the way, the way they organize this is bizarre, okay? 
They have number three, you can't do until you do four, basically four A and B, and then you can go up and do three. Now the reason for that, these are figures, and they put the figures together, and they put the text part up here, so it's really bizarre. We're starting in the middle of the page there. The sunlight's coming in on the right, and the first thing you do, they've already done the earth for you, the first thing you do is draw a vertical line through each of those moons, They're, yours are a lot rounder than mine are, and then on the back side of every one of those vertical lines you darken in the back side. Leave the, the light side light, white, don't darken it in. Really simple stuff, right? Draw a vertical line and the part away from the sunlight is darkened, the half toward the sunlight is light, right? That's the first part. You got eight moons there, starting number one, two, three, four, counting counterclockwise. There are your eight moons. Okay? Toward the sun. There's the sun over here. Sunlight's coming in here, so the side, the half of it toward the sun is always white. And the dark back side is dark. Just like it is with the earth there, you do it for all the moons the same way. They should be little earths. The back side is always dark. Okay? Now, if you have any question, ask me. Let me look at it before you do it. I prefer you do it in pencil, so if you mess something up, you can erase, like I see some people erasing. So, uh, But if you're doing it in ink, be very careful. Okay? Anyone have any doubt about what you should be doing? Looks great. Okay. All right. Do all light up. All right. So that's figure 49 1. All right. That was easy. Now, notice the numbers there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay? Now you're on the earth. Okay? You're looking at number one. What do you see? Darkness. You see complete darkness. Because you do not see this side of the moon, you only see this side. It's totally dark. So therefore, number one below on 49.2, you darken the entire moon. Right? Because you look at it, you don't see any part lit. That's, well, we'll get to that. Huh? Yeah. That's um, number one. Yeah, number, one. number one, you dark, yes. Back to question three, are we supposed to write down the names of each moon? Yeah. Not yet. That's what I said. We do the middle part first, then the bottom, then we go back to the top. The way it's put together is strange. <laughs> okay? Y'all have all got the middle part done, right? Now we're down at the bottom. You draw it, and you're on the earth looking at that moon. What do you see? Total darkness. So, darken in the entire moon. Number two is the one up there. Okay, you're looking up there. What do you see? Maybe a sliver? Just a sliver. Okay? So, what I would do there, now this is at the bottom of the page. This is number two at the bottom. To me, number two at the bottom would look something like this. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, <bless> Y'all <laughs> oh, awake yet? Okay. <laughs> Again, darken in the left-hand side, but now that's most of it. All you see light is just a little sliver. And I, I may be too, too big of a sliver, but that's all right. That's what you see. That's number two. What do you see on three? Half, you see exactly what you got there, so draw that for number three. Vertical line, the left-hand side dark, the right-hand side, leave it low. Right. Okay, number four, the one over here. How is that going to look? Okay, yeah, make your sliver a dark. Whoa, I did it in the wrong place. Okay. Make your sliver on this side, 
and color in that part, leaving most of it light. Right? That's number four. Okay, you can call it that if you like. It's just going to be most of it light, a little of it dark. Number five, what does that look like? Full moon, you see everything, so don't make a mark on number five. That's what you see, that's what you get. Right? Number six is going to look like what? Just like four, exactly. No difference. The side toward the sun is lighted, just the sliver on the back side is dark. Just like number four. So that's going to be what six looks like too. Second? Yes, okay. Number seven. What does that look like? Yes, it looks just like number three up there. They look identical because that's what you see from the earth, just like what you see here. What's that again? No, I mean, the side toward the sun is light, and the side away from the sun is dark. So don't flip it around. You always have the lighted side toward the sun. That's one of the key here. Okay? That's number seven. How about number eight? Say again? Three quarters dark, okay? Is in other words, just like number two. Right? He's saying three quarters. This is number three, and that's exactly what three looks like. Here's number seven. That's what seven looks like. Okay. Wait, wait now. Hey. Wait. Remember the side toward the sun is always lighted. So two and eight are identical. The side toward the sun is light, and that dark part is away from the sun. So don't flip them over. Always the light inside is toward the sun, the dark side is away from the sun, if you have any dark there. That's key. What's that? What kind of research? research does your wife do? She's a uh, an epidemiologist, she studies diseases, uh, she's an infectious diseases, so she does mostly things that you can catch. Her Most of her career has been on a herpes virus called CMV, cytomegalia virus, though she has done influenza and a few other things like this, and cytomegalia virus leads to hearing loss, so she's done a lot of research with hearing loss as well, as associated with CMV, cytomegalia virus. You can Google her, and you'll see she has a couple of New England Journal articles. She's, she's Fowler, Karen Fowler, Karen Brazil Fowler. What's that? Why are you still working? Why am I still working? Because if I, if I went home, she'd have the honey-do list this long. So, uh, I, I didn't say that, did I? Oh, I recorded. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Everybody got the middle part and the bottom part done. Now we're ready to go up to number three and fill in the blanks. In the spaces below, this is the top of the page. In the spaces below, write down the names of the phases corresponding to the sketches at the bottom of the page. That's why you had to do the bottom before you could do the top, and you had to do the middle before you could do the bottom. Uh, okay, uh, so go back to the top, and what's that first one? The one that you darked in completely, what do we name it? Second? New moon. New moon, okay. Dark. Okay, but the, the, the name for it is, from the previous page, New Moon. You see it? Page 382, second paragraph under, part B, New Moon. That's all you have to put for that one. For number one. For number one. Number two, though, you put two things. First, the name of it, and then second, whether it's waxing or waning. 
Number two is that one. What do we call that? Yes. Number two? Number two? Crescent. Oh, wait, a little bit. That's a crescent one. Step into the light, crescent. And is it waxing or waning? Waxing. Yes, because you're getting a little brighter every night as you go around there. Crescent and waxing. Okay. Okay, wait. What is Number three. Say again. Oh, go ahead. She, she said it's cracks and waiting. Okay. <laughs> I mean, golly. Crescent. Uh, Crescent. That's C R E S C E N T. Crescent. And it's which? Waxing. Waxing. Okay, number three. What would you call that? And there you have one of two names you could put down there. Okay. Second. You can call it a half moon, waxing or waning. It's the waning. Both. Uh uh. That one up there is. Uh uh. It's the waxing. Getting bigger every night. It went from crescent to that. Then it's going to go to give us. So it's waxing. It's waxing until it's full. So you can call it a half moon waxing. Okay. The other name you could have called it was a first quarter moon waxing. But half moon is much easier to write. Okay. Number four. It's what? No. Three quarters to you. Okay. Use the names they use. Give us. Give us. Waxing or waning. Waxing because it's still getting brighter every night. All right. You're putting more wax on it. It's getting more. Okay. And then number five. Full moon. And you don't have to put a descriptor on that because it's a full moon. Okay. Number six. It's a crazy. Really? Give us waning. That's a give us waning. Because you see, your gibbous is more than halfway lit. Right, right. That's always gibbous. More than halfway lit is gibbous. Less than halfway lit is, is crescent. So that's a gibbous moon, but now it's waning because it's getting less lit every night. No, it should be crescent waning, right? Which one? Seven. Are you all on seven? Not yet. What is seven? Sorry. Half moon, waning, exactly. Or you could have called it a third quarter moon if you wanted to, but half moon is easier to write. Half moon, so you have to have the descriptor. Waning. How about number eight? And it's waning also. Okay. Okay, the, the only two that you don't need a descriptor on is one and five. Okay? The other you need to say either waxing or waning. And I'll just give you a hint. <laughs> There's two crescents, two halves, and two, two gibbous. So make sure you got them in the right place. All right. Has everybody done page 383? Yes, sir. If you got any questions, please ask. Okay. Any questions on page 383? You got answers on everything. Okay. Now turn to 384. The last is question five, but it has six parts. Okay. Now, again to me, let's have this being the moon, I'll be the earth, and Rachel will be the sun. Okay? When does a full moon rise? Now, this is approximate time of day or descriptor of the day. When does a full moon rise? Full moon's going to be here when the sun's there and out the earth's here. It's a full moon. So, when is it going to rise? Seven. Six. Around six, what? A.M. or P.M.? A.M. That's when the sun's rising. But see, the moon is on the opposite side, so that would be. 6 p.m. 
That's when the full moon would rise. The full moon comes up when the sun's going down. Because it's on opposite. See, the earth is spinning. So when it's daylight for you, the morning for you is evening for them. You put a sun sail or you want the time? Oh, is that a six? Can we put a sunset or do you want the time? Uh, either one of them. Uh, 6 p.m. would be fine or sunset would be fine. Okay? The only thing is, see, in the winter time, the time changes, but the, the full moon would come up about the same time. So 6 p.m. might be a good time. Okay? When would you expect a new moon to rise? Every Friday. <laughs> Only one day a month. I do think you can see it in the morning sometimes. Okay, but guess what? It's between you and the sun, so when the sun comes up, it's coming up, right? So that would be, say again? Yeah, but when does it rise? 6, six a.m. Six 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 at, at 6 a.m. approximately, or sunrise. Okay? Now, the first quarter moon. That's in between the new moon and the uh, and the full moon. Okay, <laughs> well, let's see. Let me make sure I've got it going in the right direction. Yeah, it would be going. It's a half moon. It's a half moon, but it's the first quarter. Okay. When would you expect that to rise? Mm -hmm. Yeah, about a time.
going to be setting at midnight because that's going to be about 12 hours later. Right? So who can see? I can't believe. Second? Well, it's 6 p.m. It's 7 p.m. Okay, number L. The new moon or a very thick crescent moon to set. 6 p.m. 6 p.m. because it's with the sun. That's what makes it a new moon. You're absolutely right. It sets about 12 hours later. Okay. So wow. this is why sometimes, like, I will be driving or at night time, and I'm looking, and like, there's no moon. There's because no moon. Either has it, it's already set. Yeah. If it's like a. Or it hasn't risen yet. So exactly. if, it, if it's a new moon, well, obviously at night you wouldn't see it at all. It's right. already set. Yeah, because it's with the sun. You're right. absolutely right. Okay. Now, a quick rehash, folks. Notice you have gotten the vast majority of the lab done already. Your last three questions are what you're going to do over the next month, basically. That's the rest of the last one. Okay. Try to get the first night that you can see the moon, that's your first observation. Then try to do every other night after that as long as it's, you can see the moon. If you can't get the very next night, you can see the moon every other night until you can't see it at that time anymore. It's just not out there. Then wait until it comes again, and at that same time, same place, and then get your next few observations. In total, uh, in total, you expect to have. Uh, it says somewhere here. During this time, you'll be recording. Blah 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 blah. <laughs> you're going to observe at least half a cycle over some two-week interval. They may not be continuous two weeks. So therefore, if every other day, the maximum number of observations you'll probably get would be seven. If you can get five, you're going to be okay. Okay. Good deal. So you keep your lab. Yeah. Oh, by the way, did anyone leave an umbrella in here last time? I did. You did? Yes. All right. I appreciate your passion. Yeah. 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 All right. Everybody okay with it? Yeah. You can go. I'm sorry. I cheated you out of an hour of your tutoring. That's why you're going to be doing lab for a while. You're going to be making up that hour over the next month. Yeah, I'm making it out. Hi. Good deal. spend that hour looking at the moon tonight. I'm trying to get it right. I went to full moon tonight or tomorrow night? I don't know. Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. But it'll look full tonight, but it'll just be so slight you won't know that it's. On that graph, have it almost to one, but not quite. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>